Welcome to the Millennial Network Podcast. Now your host, Coach Danny Renee. What's up, y'all? Coach Danny Renee here, and this is the Millennial Network Podcast right here. Blessing the sage today, we have Jason Stubblefield. Actually, I want Jason to kind of introduce you because Jason's a millennial, and I want him to introduce himself to you guys. Jason, who are you? Uh, thank you for that, Danny. Thank you for having me today. Glad to be here, and, and hopefully I can share some useful information with your audience. So uh, the name, like I said, is Jason Stubblefield, and I am an apartment investor and syndicator. So I've been doing that, like the backstory, I'll give you just something very brief. And then if you want to go into more in depth, you know, we can ask questions throughout. But uh, just to get it started, it's like, Born in a small town, grew up, went in the military, uh, got a degree in software development, wanted to sort of change my trajectory or W-2. And then that led me to apartment investing. And so that was about 20, uh, 2015 when I really understood it and developed it. And so now I've, uh, I've made it my focus, right? So my career has been driven towards multifamily real estate. Right now, my portfolio is a little over a thousand units, and we're looking to continuously grow that um, every year. So, uh, yeah, that's just a brief intro. Okay, I appreciate that. So, what branch of the military were you in? Marine Corps. Marine. Oh, okay, I got it. I was Air Force, so you know, okay. but it's, yeah, it's you, always you all love. Off a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's always <laughs> love. It's always love. Awesome. So, you say you got out in two thousand fifteen. Um, no, no, I started, uh, oh. I started my, my multifamily journey in 2015. Got it. Got it. Okay. I just thought it was like military, didn't, you know, okay. Cause sometimes people do that. They get out of military and they just go straight into whatever they're doing. But anyway, so you started your journey in 2015. So walk me into, right. okay. Were you in the military for like, like, first of all, how long were you in the military for? Yeah. Four years. Four years. Okay. And when did you get out of military? So I got out in 2002. Okay, 2002. So you got out in 2002. Did you, oh yeah, you say you were a software developer. That's the question I really want to know. So how long were you a yeah. software um, developer, engineer before you got Ooh, into the so, so I went to, so I um I went to school for computer science. Well, actually mm-hmm. I spent time just not really having a major because I didn't know what any of those majors meant when it came to money in my pocket. So Mm -hmm. I was just in school because I thought that that's what people should do, right? You're supposed to go to school. And uh, once I got out of the military, I was like, all right, well, I need to know some more. So I went and I I used like GI Bill to try to get myself through college, Mm toured around with that. But finally, computer science was the only degree that actually made sense to me. Like, okay, I know I can make money doing something with computers. So Mm -hmm. I, I got that degree and then that was four years. So 2006 is when I started developing software and I did that up until um until not that long ago actually when I finally cut the strings and and let the software money go. Got it. So since this audience is geared towards people that are employees, right? Um and right. they are looking to take some level of interest into entrepreneurship, would you say that you started off your multifamily journey in like as a part timer? And is that possible? Yeah, yeah, I, I did everything part time. So it was it was nights, it was weekends, it was uh, early morning, and basically just getting it in wherever I could. Mm, okay. So explain to the audience what exactly is uh, multifamily uh, real estate, just for those. That yeah, yeah. Know. So um, to me, I would call it probably the the best of all real estate investing when it comes to residential, right? So if you're getting money from tenants, multifamily allows you to live the best of both worlds. So if you think about doing a flip, you basically make no money and then you put a lot of effort and money into a property, you turn it around and then you make your money on the sale. So that's a way of doing real estate. And if you're going to do fix and flip, but you also have the flip side of that, which is long-term hold, where you're going to get your passive uh, income from your tenants who are paying you. What multifamily does is it takes both of those models and combines them. So what happens um, with this model is that you receive monthly rents from the tenants, but because you have multiple units, one tenant moving out doesn't leave you without income. So as those tenants turn over, you go in and you do your remodels that way called value add investing. 
And doing that value add investing, you then come in and you increase the rents afterwards because you made that unit better for the next person or even the person who's in there right now. So because you're doing that, you increase the value of the property because these properties are evaluated based off of how much money they make. So as you make the property make more money, you then increase the value. So you get the appreciation that you would get or the long term payoff that you would get by doing a flip while you simultaneously get the monthly cash flow by holding the property with, with having more than one tenant. OK, so you said you get the long term long term payoff with the flip, meaning like as soon as you buy this terrible looking property or it's not that bad of a property put all this money into the property, you flipped it, then you just sell it for that current value right there. Is that what you mean? Right. Or so? But then you're um, saying... Yeah, you're talking about for what I do? No, no, just, I guess, because you're comparing it, right? Right, right. I want to make sure, yeah, I want to make so, sure I'm not confusing it. Yeah, so so the comparison with, with the flip is that with the flip, yeah, you buy something that's ugly, beat up, it doesn't generate any income. You fix it up and then it does generate income, whether you sell it to someone else or rent it out. Right. Mm -hmm. But in multifamily, you are buying something that is producing income. You're fixing it up while it still produces income. Mm -hmm. And then you increase the value of it. So if you go to sell it later, you now can profit through appreciation that way. Got it. OK, that makes sense. So I remember like hearing a video or like reading um a while back that you do have your like different types of um um real uh, real estate uh multifamily properties where i think some i don't know if they rank them through letters like a b c and then c maybe like section eight or something and then you know like can you can you explain like the difference between um, cause you're talking about flipping these, are we flipping these in like bad areas or good areas and we just making it better? Can you explain that process a little bit more? Yes. Yes. Let me, let me sort of go into that. So first I want to make this distinction. When I say multifamily properties, I'm talking about five units and up. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of people who teach multifamily and it's four units, three units, two units. And that's technically it is multiple units, but I'm talking about the commercial side and that's where you get the benefits of having the evaluation come from the net operating income, how much money that property produces. So that's a very big distinction between doing two, three, and four units because they get evaluated like single families, which are evaluated by how much the neighbor's property sells for. So um, A, B, and C are ba basically two different classifications. You have a classification for the neighborhood, and then you have the classification for the property. So to give you, uh, I guess, the, to explain that a little bit, you might have a, um, a area, right? That means it's got the best schools. It's got some of the, the best highways. It's very walkable. It's, you know, it's near, it's where everybody wants to be, right? So that's what you would call an A neighborhood. Then you have B, which is sort of a step down from that. Maybe it's a little bit older, not as good schools, but you know, it's still okay. And then you have C, which is a step down from B, which is uh, okay. You know, maybe it's not the greatest place, but people will still, you know, stay over there. And D is, is usually where you, uh, D should probably stand for don't because you, you don't <laughs> want to buy in those areas unless you, um, unless you know something or you specialize in just buying D assets or, or in D areas. Then you have the same classification for the property. So if you're talking about an A-class property, you're talking about something that was built in, say, the last 10 years, right? So everything's fairly new. It's in a, a good neighborhood, but the property has everything done. You don't have a lot of deferred maintenance or um, fixing up to do. B, you're going to have a step down from that. So now you're talking, these properties are probably anywhere from 11 to 25, 30 years old, right? Okay. And so you get into the point where that property is going to need to be updated. It's going to need some renovation. And then you have C, which is older than 30 years, where now you're getting into like, all right, how's the plumbing? You know, we might have to replace the roof, um, siding, all the, all the uh, appliances, major systems are getting to the point where they're going to need to be revamped or at least cared for more than they would in say uh, A or B class property. 
Okay, interesting. I'm glad you explained it to me because I'm like, I think I heard this, but let me just kind of throw it out there just to be sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you mentioned um, uh, like what the duplexes, tri quadplexes. I know here in the metro Atlanta area, it's not something that um, it's easy to find versus like if I go back home to Detroit, that's kind of like something that we seen. You know, almost on every street is you can probably get away with a duplex. Now, I know, I know the difference between like it being considered real estate, uh, or com- I'm sorry, residential real estate versus uh, commercial real estate. But some people tell people to get their start into that, like mm-hmm. in the you know two, three, four plexes. Whereas some people are like just go straight into commercial five plus units. So. What's your advice on should somebody start there just to get their feet wet wet because they can get access to these residential loans? Or you think that they can just really just go all in into getting five plus? You can really go in to get a five plus. And and this is what I tell people to do, right? Is is to think about your long term objective, right? And if you are saying that long term you want to own multiple properties, if real estate is one of the Uh, investment vehicles that you say, hey, I'm about to do real estate and I want to have me a strong portfolio, then the best way to do that is just to go for that immediately. Why? Because you end up having to do all those steps to get to where you ultimately want to be anyway. So you can go spend two, three, five, 10 years fixing and flipping, buying duplexes, um, anything, right? But if you honestly decided you want to do multifamily, then you're five, six, seven years later starting over from scratch. Whereas Mm -hmm. if you know that's what you want to do, you just do that from day one. Yes, it's not going to be as easy, but it's definitely doable. And then you put yourself in a better position. Got it. So can you tell me, like, I know you software developer, you got your military background and you wanted to get into this. Now, what was your journey um, in getting into commercial real estate that you did you one day just like, hey, I want to do this, start reading a bunch of books? Did you seek mentorship? Did you just kind of get your feet wet off of YouTube and made some errors? Like, what was your journey? It, it started for me uh, with reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So that was one of the books that really got my mind turned about how to gain true wealth, how to be rich. And from that, I set the book down. I'm like, all right, now I need to go buy some real estate. So I got started buying like single families and I bought one single family that I lived in. And then I bought another single family that was like a rental. And by the time I had got to about, uh, call it three or four houses, I was really out of money. And so I was at a standstill. And at this point, I started to just really do the math behind how long it was going to take me to be able to generate a significant amount of income from rental properties in order to be able to sustain a lifestyle. And once I looked at it, I was like, I need like 20 houses in order to be able to, to truly have something that I could live off of. And that was going to take me a long time. So at that point, I was like, I'm squirming, right? So I, I've got my job, I'm doing okay, but I'm looking at everything else I can do to try to make this go faster. And, you know, I toyed with maybe I'm going to sell residential real estate. That didn't work. I wasn't a good sales agent. Uh, did some door knocking and, and it was it was terrible. Right. Uh, I even toyed with selling Amway and, and that was <laughs> no knock to anybody that does that. But that was trash. Um, I, I basically. <laughs> it the time, uh, yeah, yeah, it was waste, waste of time. But anyways, I won't go into that. But it was. It was me just trying to figure things out. And once I heard this multifamily thing, it started making sense to me because I saw how the more properties I had in one shot, the faster I could earn income and get bigger checks. And so uh, that was like in 2015 when I finally just ironed out the plan. I was like, okay, multifamily is going to be the way to go for me. And so from that point on, it was just everything I could get my hands on. Every book that I could read, I wanted to to go ahead and just digest it because that's what I was going to do. So I mm-hmm. uh, decided I was going to buy some property. Um, I was looking for a multifamily. I was going to buy eight units, right? I, I think there was two fourplex units that they were selling uh, in Memphis. And I was like, all right, this would be a great property for me. That one didn't work out, but I did see another property and it was like 34 units. 
So this was bigger than anything I thought that I would do, yet I had just about enough money to pull it off. Um, mm. And so I was just curious enough to call and talk to the agent who was selling the property. And at that point, I got excited. So long story short, I, I pursued that property and basically put everything I had into it. And I made a ton of mistakes with that, with that property. Ooh. Right. Share some of the mistakes. Um, wow. So one of the mistakes was not verifying the income. So I didn't know that you could ask somebody for their bank statements. So I just took the pieces of paper that the person gave me and said, all right, there's this many people on the rent roll paying rent. I should make this much money. And then when I took over as the new owner first month, I'm like, where's the money? Right, it, It's not coming in. So that was a mistake on the front end. Also, I had enough money to buy the place, but I didn't necessarily have enough money to renovate the place. So I didn't know that I could get a um, renovation loan from a bank while they financed me. So that was a mistake. I didn't know how to present to a bank. So I... I went through probably at least 10 banks that were just declining me to be able to buy the property because I wasn't organizing my information the right way to let them know what I was going to do with it. So I was getting uh, unapproved for the property. So that was another mistake. And then several others that, that just came off. So I made, I made a lot of mistakes going with it. Fortunately for me, though, none of it was, was anything that, that tanked the investment. And so it it allowed me to keep going. Gotcha. So do you still have that same property? I do. Yep. You do. Okay. So obviously you learned those mistakes and, you know, turn it into a success story. The fact that you're still holding on to it. Yep. Yep. Got it. Now you mentioned, um, hold on. I'm losing my question. Uh, talking about your whole process on how you got into it, all, all your mistakes and different things like that. So you were a product of what you're, I'm assuming, teaching against now, because like you said, you did have the multiple single family homes. Um, you did try to get into what you say, like the duplex or whatnot. So you learn. So you learn from your experience. You were like, you know, I always said I'm doing this when I should have just went straight into it. Yeah. So when I was looking at the the quads, it was actually a pair of quads. So together it was going to be eight units. And I didn't necessarily, okay. necessarily know that. So what I did is basically take the information that I had at the time and ran with it. And so it was like, all right, you need to own some property. That's the first thing I did was just run out and buy some property. It wasn't until I saw that trajectory. I'm like, all right, how long is this going to take me? Then I'm like, this is going to take a long time. So that's what got me to like, all right, let me go into the multifamily space. And so now when I tell people like, yeah, if you want to shortchange it, if you if you want to to shortcut the system, then you can just go exactly there. And it's very possible. But, you know, you want to save time at this point because you don't you don't have the time and necessarily want to take the time to make all the mistakes to get there step by step. Like a lot of us are, are taught. Right. So we're taught sort of in the grade school level. Um, the, the school yeah. way of thinking, right? You got to go to first grade and then you got to go to high school and then you got to go to college and then you got to, you know, get your big boy shoes or your big girl shoes before you can step up. When in actuality, if you decide on this day that you want to go right there and from that point, that point on, every step you make is towards that goal, then you get there a whole lot faster than saying, I want to take uh, two years doing a fix and flip and I'm going to buy a property and live in it for three years. And then I'm going to start doing multifamily. Five years later, you're right beside the person who made the same decision that you made starting at day one because you decided to take the, the school route. So, yeah, I say like you should go right for what you want. It's very doable and, and it's possible. OK. Now, how does somebody get straight into that? I know you said that you shouldn't take the great screw approach, but how does someone set themselves up? And I don't know if this is a broad question or if it makes sense, but how does someone set themselves up? I'm like, hey, I'm ready to do multifamily investing. What do I need to get done? Do I need to have a certain amount of income? What about my credit score? Um, do I need to work with a real estate agent, a commercial real estate agent? Like, How do I set myself up for success with my first property? Yeah, yeah. Very, very good question. So, 
this this game is really all about being resourceful. So it's very different than single family. It's not based off of your income. That's one of the key differences with buying multifamily is that they evaluate the property first and then the buyer second. So the bank looks at the property and say, do we want to own it? And then secondly, they, they say, do, do we want this person to manage it or operate it? Um, and yes, you do need money to do that. But in this world, like I'm buying multi-million dollar assets, right? But I'm not doing it with my own money. And most of the people who do this business don't do it with their own money. So it becomes a process of just having the knowledge to know what to do and then figuring out the next best step for you. So it may be that you go out and you raise money on your first deal. It may be that you just do a five unit deal. It may be that you structure uh, a partnership with somebody else, but it gets your foot in the door because the, uh, the biggest payoff of this is just the amount of revenue that you can make in a short period of time. So if anybody's looking at this, like, I, I don't want to do all that work. You, you sort of have to understand when you play in, when you play in thousands, you make thousands, but when you play in millions, you make millions. So it's, it's not very difficult at all for you to buy a uh, million dollar, $2 million property and be able to increase that by hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions. And by the time you do two or three deals like that, you're a millionaire yourself and you just fast track every other process that was going to take you 10, 15, 20 years in order to generate that type of wealth. Gotcha. Now I'm a huge fan of Grant Cardone. Yeah. Um, you worked, watched a lot of his stuff or. I'm familiar him. with it. Yes. Right. So, so Grant Cardone is always talking about, you know, buying a single family is just crazy. It makes no sense whatsoever. And he has a, a compelling argument on why, um, like, you know, his defense, basically. Um, but one of the things that he said is if he can go back, because he did the same thing. He's bought his own house and the house. He was like, I'm not making anything from the single family house. And then he ended up getting into commercial real estate. But one of the main things that he was saying is he had to save up a certain amount of money. Um, and I'm pretty sure he had to learn other lessons or whatever to buy his um, first um commercial property. So I know that you're saying basically using an OP an OPM or other people's money, but do you have to I would assume that you have to have some type of capital, like would you have to have some type of down uh, payment even getting into the commercial space? Uh like yes. a certain no, amount of money. I, I will. Figures, figures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I'm glad you brought that up. So you do want to have some money, right? And, and that money can come from various sources. Um, okay. if, if it's not your money, which preferably it is, but um, I, I'll tell you artists like this. So I, I tapped into um, equity that I had in my home. I tapped into 401k money that I had. I tapped into my wife's 401k. So I was just basically pulling money together from various resources in order to get it. But working a W-2 job and just absolutely saving is very, very difficult in order to get a large sum of money unless you're being super frugal. Now, I don't agree with Grant Cardone when he says you should not buy a single family home. I, I know that's, that's his thing. Um, what I would say is that you should not be buying a home to live in. Every home should be an investment until you can ultimately find the home that is like your dream house or where you want to be. So if you're taking the low interest rates that you have and just going out to buy a property because, hey, you can't afford it and you want to be fly and invite your friends over and throw dinner parties, et cetera, and you don't have a certain amount of income, but you wasting, like you, you're hustling backwards. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so what I would say is that if you want to do anything in real estate, it should always be an investment. However, if you are so inclined to be like, hey, you know what? I think I can do multifamily. Then you step over there and you can you can definitely do that. OK, now you said buying it as far as an investment. Now, let's go back to Rich Dad Poor Dad. And it's funny because almost everybody I bring on here, they're talking about our red Rich Dad Poor Dad. Like, yo, we're giving him promotion. I mean, he don't need it, but right. it's crazy. Like everybody, that's one thing that everyone has in common is that they read that book. Right. Um. 
But so one of the things that I am not, I can't think today. Uh, one of the things that he was talking about when it comes to um, real estate is, hold on, I'm losing, losing my question. So you were saying like, Grant, let me just go here. So you were saying that Grant Cardone, you don't necessarily agree with this approach. There we go. So um, buy a house as an investment. Rich Dad Poor Dad says buying a house is a liability, right? But you're saying that in in the sense of buying commercial property, you pulled out the equity and that's how you use that as an asset. Are you saying that um, until, unless it's your dream house, that everything that else that you should buy, consider it as an um, investment, meaning I can go in, take the equity out and put it in certain things or like, what do you exactly mean? I don't know if that question makes sense. Yeah, I think I, I think I get where you're going. So I'm me, like all over the place. <laughs> let, let me try to. I'll, I'll basically answer it with with my story, right? So when okay. when I was first getting ready to um to buy a home, I had about eight grand. That's all I had, right? It was eight thousand dollars. I was trying to figure out how I was going to finesse this eight thousand dollars in order to be able to um buy some real estate. But I also had a credit card. There was about $8,000 in, in debt on. So I had a dilemma, which was, should I go pay off my credit card or should I take it and invest in real estate? And so I, I made the decision to go buy the real estate so that I can use the money from the real estate in order to help pay off the credit card debt. And that was um, a good decision, right? It worked out in my behalf. Now, the first house I bought, I lived with somebody and it was strategic from the very point I bought it that this was going to be a house hack in order to get me some money. At this point, I don't know multifamily though. I just know mm -hmm. hustle and try to make some money because I was renting rooms from other people. And instead of being the person renting the room, I figured I could be the person who owns the property and rent the room to somebody else. So that's that's how my story sort of played out. So what I say when I'm like, I'm not necessarily against a single family house, but if you want to do it, make sure that it is a strategic investment so that you know that where your next move is going to come from, not just to go buy it because you want to, you know, have a um, what's that? What's that thing that's, that's in the house? Everybody wants the, um, uh, the kitchen countertop. I, I can't think either, but but uh, you know, you, you got to have an open floor plan. You got to have nice floors, all, all the other stuff, and, mm. and like, no, it really just needs to be an investment and an investment only. Gotcha. Okay, so um, you're speaking of OPM when it comes to commercial. And you you just gave us the example as far as you using a credit card. What um is the what's a strategy? Um, that people who use business credit into place when it comes to commercial real estate. And is that, I know you were talking about investors as well, um, bringing money, but explain like business credit and commercial real estate. So I'm not, I'm not the best when it comes to business credit. I, I have done it, right? So, so what happened um, is, I can't bear it. I can't speak highly of because I haven't done it, but I know that I get what they're doing. But basically, you go lever up with your business, your personal income, and you try to get access to a lot of money so that you can use it if you need it. That is a way to do it if you want to use bank credit card money, right? And that's ways to get it off the credit cards. And that's a, a, a method too, right? But you just have to be crafty enough to figure out how you're going to get the funds. Got it. Because I figure like when most people get into commercial, like they may put it under their business name and then leverage all the business benefits versus their personal. So I guess then my next question is, if it's not business credit, what are the different ways that people can um, seek funding to buy their first um, commercial property? What are the different ways of OPM? Oh, oh, great. Yeah. So good question. You can definitely do that. You can start with your network, right? So I had um, I had a neighbor of mine who invested in my first real estate um, syndication. Um, I've had coworkers who have since invested with me. You know, I don't come from a lot of money, but it comes from family. So I don't have family, but friends have now started to understand what I'm doing and sort of come come along. So I would say the first place to start is just in your own backyard with people who are in your phone right now um, that you can call up and just say, hey, I'm all in on this. What do you think about it? And see if you can start to generate some money like that. 
But if you don't have a network like that, then you need to start leveraging other networks where um, you can start going to local real estate meetings. You'll find investors there and LinkedIn and Facebook, um, Instagram are great places, too, because you have um, you have groups, you have conglomerates of people who are all into multifamily. So if you join those, you can start to make connections from your own house laptop just by sending messages and then having conversations with people. Okay. Yeah. And I would assume that you have some kind of paper drawn up that make, um, that draw like the specific details of the partnership. Yes. Yeah. So you'll want to, you know, once you get further along, right, this is where it gets uh, a little bit more detail, but yeah, you want to know, you basically have to be a, a salesman or a saleswoman to be able to tell your investor, how they're going to get paid, what they can expect, and why they would want to uh, invest with you. So everybody likes real estate. You just have to be able to explain it to them in a way that makes sense. Say, hey, you put some money right here, you'd be able to earn this amount uh, by partnering with me. Gotcha. Okay. And I know I asked this question like in different ways, um, but so I know there's not one set answer as far as like how much do you really need to put down on getting a commercial property. Now, in my mind, I don't know if this is true, but I remember I was like, if I need a million dollar multifamily property, I got to at least put down 100,000. It does it typically work that way with the banks. Is there some type of math formula to where you can kind of get an idea of how much you need up front? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's usually going to be about call it 25 to 30% of whatever you're buying. Okay. It's, it's the money that you're going to need to close. And that's, you know, you want to try to get your debt finance where you have to put down 20% in commercial real estate. That's almost a standard, right? For a typical property, you can find some a little bit lower, but the average bank is going to give you anywhere from 25 to 20% um, down payment requirement. So that's going to have to come from you. And you want to have the other 5% for closing costs and you want to put a little bit of money aside just for a rainy day um, in, in case something goes wrong, you have money to pull from. So yes, for whatever you're buying, you want to think about 25% of that. Now where people mm -hmm. get hung up at is they go out and for one, they don't even know where to look for properties at because in the commercial world, it's not like residential where you got some agent out here saying, hey, come buy my $2 million asset. They're not there that because it's a smaller question. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a smaller pool of people. But there are commercial real estate builders, especially in, in some neighborhoods where some other people just don't go, that are two hundred thousand dollars, three hundred thousand dollars, five, six units. But the beautiful thing of it is, is that the process of a five unit that costs two hundred thousand dollars and a, a, a five hundred unit that may cost two hundred million is the exact same. So that's why as soon as you can get over that five unit hurdle, now you understand a process that you can go buy any amount of real estate and you sort of generate uh, a funnel where you get access to more money, you get access to bigger deals. And as that keeps going, now you're in the multi-million dollar realm and you have this, this amazing portfolio in a short period of time. Gotcha. So since it's a small community, is it very competitive? Yes, it, it is. Um, it is competitive, especially nowadays. Like it's a competitive real estate market. And so that's why it's important that you present yourself well as you're coming into it. Because in, in this world, there there's a group of brokers and they control the majority of the deals. And so mm -hmm. I don't do wholesaling. I'm not... Um, knocking on doors or driving for dollars, even though you could do those things. Um, but mainly I go to brokers because they're doing the exact same thing that anybody who's driving for dollars or sending out mailers are doing. The brokers are doing these things and it's their job, right? So I, I don't try to compete with them. I just go try to try to uh, participate with them. But yeah, so you talk with those brokers, you find them, and then you tell them what you're looking for and they'll start to send you properties, but they have all these properties there that you won't see on the MLL system anywhere. You won't see advertised on the internet. You just have to know and have a relationship with that broker. Okay. So is it kind of like when it comes to commercial, 
because I know you're using the term broker. And I don't know when it comes to commercial, you have an agent, then a broker, and you go with the agent and you still got the buyers and the seller's agent. Is that kind of how it's set up or is the term just strictly broker? Right, right. Yeah, that, that's another um, distinction between single and multifamily. So you mm-hmm. you don't do the typical residential real estate where you have an agent for you and then you have an agent for the seller. Um, that okay. that model doesn't carry on well. And so you'll find people, you'll find agents who will want to have you sign an agreement to go find your multifamily. But, but anybody who's listening to this podcast would know better than to do that because you don't need that. What you have is the broker. You don't need what part? The agent? You don't need an agent to represent you. Right. Okay. So in, in this world, the, the broker gets access to the property. And then the broker also tries to get the buyer. So the broker is always the buyer agent and the seller agent. However, you have to understand their first agreement is with the seller who agreed to sell them mm-hmm. the property. So they're really not working for you. They're just sort of working with you because they're on both sides of the transaction. So it becomes a little bit more lawyer intensive because you're going to represent, I won't say you represent yourself, but this is, this is the reason why you want to work with people who have knowledge. So you have a contract that you know what to look out for that's written sort of for you. And then you have your own legal counsel that sort of makes sure that you're protected because the buyer of the seller is just working on their behalf, not on yours. Wow. So the only way you really can look out to make sure that you're making, because I'm assuming that you got to do all the comps yourself and whatnot. They may kind of give, give you certain info, but you kind of got to do your due diligence. But at the same time, you got to have your own team available to make sure that the deal Right, um, right. Yeah. It's it's the whole trust but verify, right? So so they're gonna the brokers wanna tell you about the deal, they wanna tell you about the rents. They're they're looking for the value so they can sell it. So they do put a lot of effort into creating a sales package to justify, you know, you buying that property at that price. But it's your job to go through and verify all that because they're, they're not looking out for you. And if you miss something, mm-hmm. then you're the owner now and everybody else is just going to walk away. Gotcha. Okay. So you, you mentioned earlier also when you get in the door and you buy your first five, then it makes it easier to start, or maybe easier is not the word, but I'm just going to say easier, easier to start purchasing more, right? So once you get in the door, Obviously, your net worth increased because now you have this property. And it's just a matter of what's the equity in the property, I would assume, and something like that. Yes, no. Yes, maybe. yes. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and when you said buy your first five, I'm, I'm only talking about one property, one purchase that has five years. Right. Right. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, first yeah, multi You've now just, you've now just executed the process. That will allow you to go buy 50 units, 500 units. So once you do it that one time, you know, that's why I encourage people just to go right there because you're going to have to learn that model anyway. So the quicker you can do that, the quicker you can start moving on and bigger, building a bigger portfolio. Gotcha. So when you buy that, that mm-hmm. one commercial unit, um, how fast does, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Principle. How how fast does the principal move in the sense that people are um, paying you monthly towards uh, the the rent net of the loan, but then also you still got the principal and then the equity. Like, is there a certain amount of time where like the the equity develops a lot faster in a commercial property than it would in a residential? Yes, yes. It, it's. Um, <laughs> I was like, was that the right question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I get what you're saying, right? So if you buy, here's one of the, the biggest differences, right? If you buy, call it a $300,000 single family home, and you want that $300,000 single family home to appreciate, you basically have to just sit and wait for the $300,000 home to appreciate because the market did it. The market made mm-hmm. it go up, you know, interest rates came down, people start buying more in that area, and now it's worth more. In the multifamily commercial world, 
you could buy the same, call it same $300,000. But if you can make the income of that place double, then you can go from 300000 to 600000 as quickly as you can get the income from double what it is. And you don't need a market to justify that. You don't need anybody to make you wait. You just need to know what you're doing and execute. And so because you can do that, it doesn't even take a lot. But if anybody who's lived in an, in an apartment building, um, you usually get a rental increase every year. They they come to you, here's your $15, here's, here's $25, sometimes even more than that. But what they're doing every time they do that is they're increasing the value of that by, because however large that apartment community is, if you take $25 times, call it 100 units, right? That's $2,500 a month. You multiply that out by a year. Um, they just exploded that property by so much more wealth by doing just that incremental increase in rents. Wow. And so you have people who who are in the space who literally buy properties and just go raise everybody's rent up by $100 the day they take over. Um, and at that point, when they have all those new leases signed, whatever they did to the value is now there. Or you can still do it with even on the expense side. It doesn't necessarily have to be rent. You can have just a property that's poor managed and they're paying too much in expense costs. So you come out and just say, nope, we're not paying that. Um, nope, we're going to cut payroll by this. Or you find a better way to save and water utilities. And suddenly you just exploded the income that way. So when I talk about financial freedom and being able to gain a lot of wealth quickly, to me, this is one of the most efficient and, and fastest ways to go about doing that, which is why, why I buy apartments. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what about now you, you own one or two commercial units, however many, how does the equity play into getting another one? Because I'm assuming that you maybe to just pull out of that equity or leverage that equity to buy another one. Then if you got two, now you got two equities. And then is that kind of like one of the ways that people multiply? You you can do that. So there are there are lenders out there who can look at your business plan and say, all right, we'll give you a loan for two years, uh, thinking that you'll probably execute that business plan within two years. And then you flip it out and you refinance the property. So you get all that initial equity back out and then you can then take it just like the, uh, the Burr strategy, um, buy, rent, rehab, rents, repeat. So you can do that model in multifamily or you could go ahead and just sell the asset and then roll that into another asset uh, via 1031 or not. But it's it's a way that for you to flip or recycle the same the same money over and over again. Okay, so you decide on if you're going to buy and hold just so that the equity can go up so that when you sell it years later, now that equity, you made enough money to where you may be to buy a bigger unit or something. Right, right. And, and, and yeah. so, you know, I, ideally, people want long term cash flow. Right. Mm -hmm. You love the idea of having a beautiful property where you can just say, I own that and it pays me whatever, $10,000 a month. In the beginning, you just don't have enough money, right, to go out and buy the type of asset by yourself that will allow you to go get that one property. Most people don't, right? And even if you did, do you want to put all of your money into one property? Most people don't. So partnerships become very keen when you're doing the business. But what most people end up doing is you buy something. Okay, maybe it's a little ugly. It's a five unit. It's in a C-class area. Um, but then you take it, you, you execute your plan, and now you go do a bigger property. And now you go do a bigger property. And soon the profits of that allow you to go do, now you can go buy that, that 15, 20 unit where you just own it by yourself, and that, that takes care of you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you familiar with Jay Morrison? I am. The Tulsa. Okay, so I don't know if this is a fair question to ask, considering you're in a space and I know how big networking is. Yeah. But you have, say, for instance, you do have that new person that wants to get into um, real estate, right? And I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a lot more out there, right? But you mm -hmm. have Grant Cardone, where you can invest into, 
his real estate firm because you really don't want to do it. You don't want to get your hands dirty. You're like, oh my God, this is too much work. I'm going to just go with him because he's proven to have results. But then, then you got someone that, you know, on a smaller scale, um, but still expected to be successful is you got the Tulsa fund and all of that. Um, and what is your advice to those people that's just like, you know, I want to invest in either of these companies or companies similar versus doing it myself? All right, make sure I understand the question. Like you, you're asking my recommendation on somebody who wants to invest passively in some other company. Yeah, that's going to do everything. Um, all right, honestly, so, so I've done that. I invested in the Tulsa Real Estate Fund. Um, okay. I've invested in, in other people's properties who do the same thing that I do. That's, yeah. that's a great place to be at. If you are working some somewhere else you got a nine to five or if you are uh you got a business that just generates money and you you have discretionary income it's great to be able to give it to somebody else let them work for you and then you benefit in the profit so that's something that i would definitely encourage people to do i would say that you want to check the track record of that person and you you want to also see if you can get references from them um Follow them, see what they're doing, right? See if they've done other similar projects like that so you don't lose your money, right? Because you can lose your money like that if you just go throw it around. So do your due diligence on whoever it is that you look to invest with. Right. Which means at at the end of the day, you still got to do your homework up front. Right. Yep. Right. Okay. So um, in passive income with commercial real estate, I, again, Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, he he talks about the taxes, right? Is tax less or something? Um, tell me the benefits of taxes in the commercial space. And it's also, and then I guess another question is, could you refinance, take the money out, and then sell it to not pay taxes on it too? So, two questions in one. Uh, I, I'll address the the, the last one first, <laughs> right? So. You okay. can refinance and not pay any taxes. But if you sell okay. ever, it's going to be a taxable event. Okay. So so they're going to come for you for the taxes uh, on a sale. So there are a lot of benefits, though. So what, what we do is maybe a little bit too in-depth, but just, you know, ask questions if it doesn't make sense. So what we do is a cost segregation study on all our properties. And that allows you to take the depreciation of a property, which is in commercial is 32 and a half, somewhere around that, 30 some years, but to condense it into like five, five to 15 years. And so because we're doing that and we're taking so much depreciation, it's a great shelter for income. Um, so we pay distributions monthly to our investors. And then at the end of the year, we give them what we call a K1 statement that will say that they lost money. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you, you can be sort of baffled at, like, no, you paid me money every, you know, every month for the last 12 months. And now you give me a statement saying that I lost X amount of dollars. And that's because you, you basically use the tax strategies for it. So it's very tax advantageous to be in real estate. Um, you know, just make sure you find somebody to do it all legally, but the tax codes were written to do it. Mm-hmm. Got you. And how do you identify a good real estate uh, property? Like what are some of the things that you look at numbers wise and location and all that? Um, yeah, so so it, it's a lot, but I'll try to just give a few that most people will, will find valuable. Uh, first, I would say just look where it makes sense for you, right? If you're in, in um, wherever, if you're in California and you're looking, um, it doesn't make any sense to buy something in California, then don't look in California. But if you uh, have family somewhere that you're comfortable with an area or you just live in an area where you're comfortable at, look there. If you've got Uh, friends or family in another area, then look there. Just make sure that the market you choose makes sense for you. And then when you're looking for properties, I can only tell you the way I look for it. And so I look for something that has, uh, that's not too old, that doesn't have a lot of deferred maintenance, that's in a decent area um, where I can add value to. So I look for that 
that money play right in the beginning. What can I do with this property? How can I save on it? Is it in a good market where I can just ride with the market? Can we come in, fix it up and make it nicer and then make it more valuable? And if that's a go, then we just come up with the price that's worth um, worth us buying it at. Okay. And you have your mentorship, right? I do. So can you explain to me um, who is your mentorship geared towards? I mean, I would assume people that um, want to get into commercial real estate unless you have like in a specific niche, but who is it geared towards and what should they expect if they did come to you? Yeah. So, so my mentorship is really a conglomerate of my own personal mentorships. So I mentioned earlier that I started, I had no mentor. And that's when I used all my own money, right? Because I, I had just enough to get there. Um, but I experienced a lot of headaches with that, right? We were just dealing with that property. That property was my my whole world, right? I, I'm, I've got all my money into it and I was tied up. So um, at some point, things did calm down a little bit. And at that point, someone suggested to me that, well, Jason, you know, you can do another deal if you raise money from other people. And I immediately was like, that's cool, but I'm not going to make these mistakes with somebody else's money. Like I just, as a person, I wouldn't do that. Like I could lose my own money. It would, you know, crush me more to lose somebody else's. So I immediately started looking for a mentor, but because I had a mentor, it led me to my next deal within the next year that then grew my portfolio. And by doing that next deal, it led me to another mentor, which led me to uh, that was a 400, that was a 48 unit property. That next deal after the first one, the next deal was a 350 unit deal because I had partners, right? That knew how to do things bigger. And I had skills from doing these two smaller deals. Now we could combine joint forces and go bigger. So I, I constantly have big mentors. And the reason why is because to go there faster, right? I don't want to take all the bumps and bruises anymore. Like I don't want to waste the time of learning and going through when I feel like there's somebody else who's already done it and they can tell me how to do it. I mean, for instance, like I, now I've, I'm about to buy my second semi truck, right? A few months ago, I didn't know anything about semi trucks, but it's, right. it's passive for me, but I'm doing it because somebody else who who's done it can show me. And so when it comes to my program, I told you that I didn't start off with a mentor. Now I have, multiple mentors and I've taken the best things that I've learned from my mentors and seen how it works for me and said, okay, I could take that part from that mentor. I could take this part from this mentor and I can do small deals. I can do large deals. And I basically take it and condense it and try to make it very, very hands on and catered to every person that I work with so that they get what they need. Because my goal is to see whoever I work with be successful because that's, that's what you should do. Other than that, you just waste the mm -hmm. time. You can go buy a bunch of, you know, courses and not do anything with them. But um, I, I strongly believe that if you you pay for something, you should get what you pay for. Gotcha. So you got anywhere from people that's brand new, spanking new, don't know anything into your mentorship, or do you expect people that, with a little bit of experience? Yes, you could be brand new. So there's not anything that's left out. Basically, go from here's what the program is, here's how you underwrite, here's how you get deals coming to you, here's what to look out for, here's our underwriting model, here is our property packages that we use to go raise money with. Like basically everything that I have becomes accessible to everything that my mentees have. And then also here's how to go about getting money and show you how to do that quickly so you can get access to $1 million, $2 million, $5 million to go out and do deals. Got you. And as far as recession proof, right now, you, I'm assuming like, well, unless you were doing your single family in 2008, you know, we had 2008 going on, but you're actually in one of the weirdest spots now we have COVID. So what are, I guess, some of the pros and cons with the commercial space when it comes or that you've experienced even right now with COVID and, or just what makes it recession proof or just ultimately the pros and cons of an up and down market? Yeah, so so there, there are studies out that people basically look back on the last Great Recession to see 
um, how different asset classes perform. Multifamily had the lowest default rate <clears throat> of all residential real estate. So people weren't throwing the, the, the keys back to the bank when it came to multifamily properties. Some did, but a lot less than than other markets like single family. So the COVID situation has just made everything a little bit more difficult, but it's also made, uh, I think, a better connection between being an owner and then being uh, a person who's concerned about your tenants. Because <clears throat> when they came with us, first thing we want to, to do is make sure that our tenants are safe. Um, and then we also want to make sure that we were providing for them, being that we had them losing jobs and um, you know, they're shut down. You can't go to work. There's no money there. The only thing you got was six hundred dollars. So it, for, it forced us as owners to be like, how can we help people out? Right? What type of uh, leniency can we do as a property? Also, what type of government agencies can we tap into to sort of help people out? And I think that that has grown and been uh, a plus. Then the negative side of COVID has just been everything about COVID, and everything's taking longer. So. When it comes to getting our financing, you know, it was delayed because of COVID. Finding contractors or people to work right now has been more of a hassle. But I don't see it as anything that's multifamily specific. I just think it's mm -hmm. it's our environment right now while we're dealing with with COVID. And that's that's actually good information, and I and I appreciate that because I remember when I was um in Afghanistan some years ago, I had met this um, army sergeant and. He was in the military and he got out, did really well in uh, real estate, even ran for office where wherever he was located. But he had to get back in the military because after 2008, he was like, this is what he told me. I remember he saying like the bank asked for the loans back or something. Uh, I don't know if you know much about that, but it's just like, OK, so you got these commercial properties and you're paying on them, but they can just ask for the loan back. So do you know anything about that or could that just have been? He wasn't doing his diligence as far as like paying the monthly in it. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so what happened there um, was where the banks want you to have 80% leverage or say, so the bank call it, keep number simple. If we're buying something for a hundred thousand, the bank only wants to loan you money up to 80,000. They want you to come up with the other 20,000. So mm -hmm. what was happening or what that person was witnessing was, they were coming out maybe at the end of their term, of their commercial term. So they may have had a five-year term. That five years ended. The bank reassessed the property and then said, oh, now that property is only worth, call it $80,000, right? So we still want you to give us no, we still want you to have a 20% um, leverage, right? We want you to have 20% equity into the property. So... Because of that, now they want you to put in more money or they're calling the property due. And if you don't have that money, then that is uh, a problem, right? And that's that's how banks right. are calling calling loans due. So the way to avoid that, what, it, what has happened is just to make sure that you have ample amount of term time in your bank loan, meaning that you want to have a bank loan that say, Call it five years is your term before they're going to relook at this property. But everything I want to do with this property, meaning like all the renovations, I'm going to execute in two years. Mm -hmm. So if the market goes south on me, right, I've now got that additional three years to figure it out. Right. To yeah. to either sell early, the market could correct on its own. But what you don't want to do is go in with a very short term view with it with a short term loan and then you don't necessarily know and then you get caught holding the bag where like this is how the market shifted now and so now you now you owe us this. Yeah. Okay. So we have your mentorship. Um you help we already went over that part on how you help people. Um now what is the best way for people to reach out to you if they want to seek mentorship or if you have any tools or resources available? Yeah, yeah. If, if you're interested in just hearing a little bit more about the store or seeing one of the properties, you can go to learnwithjason.com. Uh, it's learnwithjason.com. And then uh, I'm on social media. So you just search for me, Jason Stubblefield. You should be able to find me uh, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn. And I try to just put out 
useful nuggets about about real estate to help people along. Perfect. Well, I appreciate it, Jason. Thank you so much for giving me your time today, for giving us your time today at the Millennial Network Podcast. And again, y'all, this is your girl, Coach Danny Renee. This is the Millennial Network Podcast, where your network equals your network. We're out.